What if I told you that African people were the first people to create civilization? What if I told you that some of the technology that we are using all originated in Africa? What if I told you that Greek philosophy to begin with is a misnomer, as all philosophy originated in Africa? What if I told you that everything you know about Africa, ancient Egypt, and Kemet has been suppressed in order to perpetuate African inferiority? Join us today on A Pretty Lie Instead of an Ugly Truth, Episode Zero, The Truth About Africa and Egypt. The history of Africa and ancient Egypt is probably one of the most controversial topics that I'll ever cover on this channel. So if you're a person who gets offended easily, do yourself a favor and exit out of this presentation right now. Now contrary to common belief, ancient Egypt is single-handedly the most researched subject in the world. And conversely, ancient Egypt is also the least understood of all known subjects on the planet, despite what mainstream academia will have you believe. Now I know what some people at home are going to say. This is an incongruity. I mean, how could Egypt be so well researched, yet at the same time, we don't understand very much about it today? Well, the truth of the matter is, modern day anthropologists have a pretty good idea of what transpired in ancient Egypt nearly 5,000 years ago. The problem is, and I want to reiterate for the people in the back, the problem is racism and Eurocentrism. And before anyone gets all bent out of shape and tries to contest what I'm saying, allow me to prove the validity of my claim. Let's assume that I'm a racist who doesn't like black people. And let's assume that I also have control over the printing press, the distribution of books, media, television, scholarships, schools, and other learning institutions. Now, do you think for a second that I would tell the truth about the amazing contributions that African people made to the world? Or do you think that I would do everything in my power to lie and uphold the myth of European superiority. Now what most people don't understand is that when Egypt was first being studied, slavery was still being institutionalized all over the world. And under no circumstances, and I mean under no circumstances, could the truth about ancient Egypt be uncovered or revealed to the masses. To suggest that black people were anything other than savages, hut builders, or slaves would upset the European status quo. For if anyone were to ever find out that black people aka the Egyptians, and yes I said black people were the Egyptians, were the true creators of civilization, astronomy, and the technology that we are using today. It would prove without a shadow of a doubt that the Europeans of that time period were not the true creators of science, reading, math, or philosophy. And what they should be known for is altering history. Now at this particular point in time in the story I want to throw out a disclaimer so everybody at home cannot misinterpret what I'm saying. Am I saying that every European on earth altered history in an attempt to make themselves look superior to other groups of people? Absolutely not. That'd be ridiculous. Am I saying that certain Europeans in that time frame and some Europeans now in this millennia have altered history in an attempt to make themselves look superior to black people? Absolutely. Let me give you a real life example to prove the validity of my claim. In the mid 1790s, a French count by the name of Constantine de Volney published a book entitled The Ruins of Empires. In this book, Volney chronicalized his travels to Egypt between 1783 to 1785. This book immediately became an instant bestseller in France, and it wasn't long before it was translated in English by Thomas Jefferson for an American audience. Now, what most people are not aware of is that since African people were still being enslaved in the Americas around this time, the publishers decided to delete special segments of the text in order to hide the truth about African people. You know, because Europeans couldn't have the truth about black people coming out. Complete sentences were deleted or altered from pages 15, 16, and 17. Now, fortunately for us today, I have a copy of his original text in all of its glory. Begin quote. They are a people now forgotten, who discovered, while others were yet barbarians, the elements of the arts and sciences, a race of men now ejected from society for their sable skin and frizzled hair, founded on the study of laws of nature, those civil and religious systems which still govern the universe. Now I know some people at home are gonna do their best to refute this passage, but before you do that, ask yourself a serious question. 
If this passage really didn't mean anything and it didn't substantiate that African people were actually the creators of civilization and other individuals were just savages during the time period that Africans were around, as Volney stated, then why was this passage omitted from his text? Why was Thomas Jefferson so concerned that he had to take this passage out if it truly didn't mean anything? The reason that this quote was omitted from Volney's book was because this passage validates what I had stated earlier about the Egyptians being black. It also substantiated that African individuals were the first people on earth to create civilization. Nearly a hundred years later, the African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois provided us with an explanation of the Europeans' inability to accept the fact that the people of the Nile were the first to create civilization. Begin quote, The rise and the support of capitalism called for the rationalization based upon degrading and discrediting the Negroid peoples. It is especially significant that the science of Egyptology arose and flourished at the very time that the Cotton Kingdom reached its greatest power on the foundation of American Negro slavery. And if that is not enough proof for you, check this out. This quote comes from Sheikh Anta Diop's African Origins of Civilization. Begin quote. In 1799, Napoleon undertook his campaign in Egypt. Thanks to the Rosetta Stone, hieroglyphics were deciphered in 1822 by Champollion the Younger. Egyptologists were dumbfounded with admiration for the past grandeur and perfection then discovered. They gradually recognized it as the most ancient civilization that had engendered all others. But imperialism being what it is, it became increasingly inadmissible to continue to accept the theory, evident until then, of a Negro Egypt. The birth of Egyptology was thus marked by the needs to destroy the memory of a Negro Egypt at any cost and in all minds." End quote. And if that's not enough proof for you, don't worry, I got you. In 1916, James Henry Breasted, the first American to receive a PhD in Egyptology in 1894 from the University of Berlin, wrote a high school textbook entitled Ancient Times, A History of the Early World. And in this book, Breasted wrote about the amazing accomplishments of the ancient Egyptians, and he described them as brown-skinned men with dark hair. Now, what most people don't know is that this very book happened to be John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s favorite book. And for those of you who are not aware, Mr. Rockefeller happened to be the son of the wealthiest American of all time, John D. Rockefeller Sr. Now, because Rockefeller Jr. was so impressed with Mr. Breasted's work, Rockefeller decided to fund Breasted's research by giving him $1.5 million to establish the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. And again, for the people at home who are not aware, this quote unquote generous donation came with a caveat. You see, James Henry Breasted couldn't just take that man's money without paying him back. So a second edition of his book, Ancient Times, in 1935 was produced. And here, my friends, is where things get very interesting. Instead of keeping the majority of his book the same, this time, Breasted removed all references of the Egyptian people being brown-skinned. In addition to that, Breasted added a brand new chapter where he went on to state that the Egyptians were part of the Great White Race. Now, according to Breasted, the Great White Race stretched from Northern Europe to Northern Africa, and the Black Race begins just south of the Second and Third Nile Cataracts in the region where Lower Nubia transitions to Upper Nubia. Breasted then proceeded to explain that the people of the Great White Race spread throughout the Northwest Quadrant at the end of the Paleolithic period. So as you all just saw, James Henry Breasted just got caught contradicting himself. In his initial work, Ancient Times, he clearly stated that the Egyptians were brown-skinned men with dark hair. And now in his new book, Ancient Times Volume 2, he stated that they were all white or part of the Great White Race. Now, before we go any further, I just wanted to take the opportunity to stop the presentation for the people at home as something just transpired that I think it's very important that I point out. This is exactly why you can't trust everything you hear and read at home, because the majority of these scholars and their opinions can be altered and bought out with the almighty dollar. Normally, I would move on and continue with the story as we have a lot to cover. But today, I'm going to spend a little more time on James Henry Breasted, as this man was considered by most to be the father of Egyptology. And for the people at home who don't know who this guy is, allow me to explain once more. One, James Henry Breasted was the first American to obtain a PhD in Egyptology at the University of Berlin. Two, 
he was the director of the Haskell Oriental Museum. Three, and in 1905, he was promoted to the full professor and held the first chair in Egyptology and Oriental history in the United States. So as you guys can all see here, this guy is a pretty big deal. And I personally think an extra amount of attention should be brought to this man as he was considered to be the head of Egyptology at the time. Like I had mentioned in the first edition of James Henry Breasted's book, Ancient Times in 1916, Breasted used illustrations of modern natives, including indigenous Australians, Native Americans, and Inuits, as ethnographic analogies for the state of prehistoric culture and technology. And according to Breasted, Tasmanians were cited as the first example of the lowest savage tribes, discovered by Europeans, therefore the closest living analogy to the conditions of life in the Old Stone Age. The next chapter then chooses to jump to the pre-diagnostic era in Egypt. According to Breasted, the people of Stone Age Europe, as he believed Europeans were still primitive and stuck in the Stone Ages, were unable to advance any further without outside influences, namely influence from the Near East. Before introducing Egypt, Breasted reminds his readers that civilization originated in the Orient with civilization being defined here as the ability to write, manipulate metal, form centralized governments, and engage in long distance commerce, AKA trade. Ancient Egypt, according to Breasted, was the first civilization to make the great leap forward by developing a complex writing system and centralized government. He then proceeds to remind his audience that Egyptian civilization carried on into the Christian age and thus into Europe. Now, why is this important and what relevance does this have with the story, you might ask? I'll tell you. As I just mentioned, Mr. Breasted spent an exceptional amount of time categorizing different groups of people in his first edition of his book in order to prove who was more primitive than who. Europeans were categorized as Europeans, Australians were categorized as Australians, Native Americans were categorized as Native Americans, Inuits were categorized as Inuits, Tasmanians were categorized as Tasmanians, and Egyptians were categorized as Egyptians. All of these groups, according to Breasted, were completely different. And according to him, some were more prehistoric than others. Now, if the Egyptians were part of the great white race, like he stated in his second book, why would he say in his first book that Europeans and Europe could not have advanced any further without outside influences, namely Egyptians? And again, if Egypt was a part of the great white race, like he stated, Breasted wouldn't have called them an outside influence. Now, would he? So which one is it, Mr. Breasted? Are Egyptians black or are they part of the great white race? Do you not think that people here are reading your book? Because I'm reading your book, partner. I've read the book twice, the first edition and the second edition. So let's get that on the wax right now. Are they part of the white race or are they part of the Egyptian black race? I'm gonna go with the second and say that the Egyptians were black because that was before Mr. Breasted took a bribe from John D. Rockefeller Jr. and changed his story. And you know what's crazy about all of this? If we were in a school, this would be the textbook definition of academic dishonesty. And James Henry Breasted is supposed to be the father of Egyptology. This guy is the father of Egyptology, yet we caught his ass in two lies today. Two lies! And if anyone thinks I'm making this up, Here's the exact excerpt from ancient times before he took the bribe from Mr. Rockefeller. And again, if you're curious as to where this can be found, here is the exact citation. It's located in Breasted, Ancient Times, the 1916 edition, page 33 to 34. After 50,000 years of progress carried on by their own effort, the men of Stone Age Europe seem now about 3000 BC to have reached a point where they could advance no further. Haha, <laughs> let me reiterate that. After 50,000 years of progress carried on by their own efforts, the men of Stone Age, Stone Age Europe, seem now about 3000 BC to have reached a point where they could advance no further. They were still without writing, as you just heard, they were without writing, for making the records of business, government, and tradition. They were still without metals with which to make tools and to develop industries and manufacturers. And they had no sailing ships 
in which to carry on commerce. So they didn't even have a ship to do trading. Without these things, they could go no further. All these and many other possessions of civilization came to early Europe from the Near Orient, the lands around the eastern end of the Mediterranean. In order to understand the further course of European history, we must therefore turn to the Orient, which came these indispensable things, which made it possible for our European ancestors to gain the civilization we have inherited. So all of these great things, metals, writing, reading, trading, sailing, all came out of Africa and the Orient. It did not come from European culture. And just for the sake of conversation today, let's take a look at James Henry Breasted's map of the Orient. As you all can see here, Egypt was a global empire that spread all the way up into Europe. In addition to that, during the time frame in question, the only groups of people that were alive in the Orient were Africans, but more on that later. Now this raises a serious question. How are black people supposed to follow his story or read and interpret anything and believe it at face value when these individuals, such as James Henry Breasted, who is the father of Egyptology, can manipulate history, alter the facts, and change the story in an attempt to make Africans look like they're down here and Europeans and other groups look like they're up here. How can black people trust anything at this particular point in time when I just showed you that the facts have been altered to benefit certain groups? And if you thought that James Henry Breasted was the only quote unquote scientific authority to talk about African studies or to alter history, oh man, get ready. Now, before I turn the mic over to Mr. Ages, it would be remiss of me not to mention my disdain for the school systems here in America. All of the research that I just presented and some of the research that I will continue to present in this lecture is over 40 years old. Now, why is this important and what relevance does this have with the story, you might ask? Don't you find it funny that none of the information that I presented today was read or sourced from an elementary, high school, or college textbook? In fact, I couldn't find any of this information in a single history book. I can't tell you how many elementary slash high school textbooks I went through looking for the contributions that African people made to civilization. And not once, not once was I able to find a single passage that talked about the contributions that were made to the world by African people. Now, I'm going to ask a rhetorical question as I already know the answer to this. Why is this information that I just reviewed not being taught in the school curriculum? To fully answer Sid's question in regards to the school system not teaching true African history, all one needs to do is fully research the origins of school. You see, contrary to what people believe, school was never intended or designed to create free independent thinkers, nor was it created to promote black excellence. Let me give you a quick history lesson to prove the validity of my claim. The video that we're going to be reviewing today is appropriately titled The Origins of the American Public Education System, Horace Mann and the Prussian Model of Obedience. Horace Mann was an American educator who served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, part of the American Congress. Horace Mann was the key reformer of the education system at the time. In 1837, he became the head of the newly created Board of Education in Massachusetts, where he began the work that would eventually earn him the title as the father of American public education. After reading through the educational models of different countries, Mann finally hears about a particularly successful style that had been developed in Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany. The Prussian system had shown to be such a success for the government's purposes that, accompanied by a few other educators, Horace Mann travels to Germany to investigate. Upon their return to the United States, they lobbied heavily to have the Prussian model adopted. All in favor say aye! Interest in Prussia had also been growing in the northern half of the continent. Around this time, the Canadian superintendent of schools, Egerton Ryerson, traveled to Prussia in search of a new model of education. His journeys also included visiting Horace Mann in Massachusetts to further examine the system he would eventually adopt. 
George Brown, the editor of Toronto's Globe newspaper, was even quoted saying that Ryerson had successfully imported Prussian education into Ontario. During the next 30 years or so, a whole line of American dignitaries came to Germany to earn degrees. Interestingly enough, those who earned degrees in Germany came back to the United States to staff all the major universities. By 1900, all the PhDs in the United States were trained in Prussia. As the first secretary of the State Board of Education, Horace Mann promoted his new concept that the state is the father of children. He stressed that it was the responsibility of the state to ensure that education was provided for the child. A very noble idea, of course, but what exactly did he mean by that? And how did he define education? Horace Mann's 10th annual report in 1846 led to the first state law that made it mandatory for children to go to school. Pause. So let's do a quick recap, shall we? Horace Mann, who was part of the United States House of Representatives, heard about a new model of education in Germany, aka Prussia, aka Europe, and decided to adopt it for the U.S. Horace Mann then passed a law in his 10th annual report and made it mandatory for every child to go to school in 1846. Now, why do you think Horace Mann did this? And why did Horace Mann adopt something from Germany? It was during that year that he supported the governor of Massachusetts in adopting the Prussian model of education for the entire state. How did he do that? The governor of the time, Edward Everett, as it turns out, was the very first to receive a PhD from... Can you guess where? That's right. Prussia. From then on, it spread very quickly. Just after Everett installed the Prussian model in the state of Massachusetts, the governor of New York set up the very same method in 12 New York schools. Horace Mann's sister, Elizabeth Peabody, of the Peabody Foundation, saw to it that right after the Civil War, the Prussian system that was then being taught in the northern states was integrated into the conquered south. By 1900, most of the compulsory schooling laws that implemented the new system had been passed. From then on, every American child grew up under the Prussian system. So what exactly was the Prussian education system that everyone thought was so amazing that it just had to be adopted throughout the free world? Pause. This is extremely important, so if you haven't been paying attention up until this point, pay attention to this. To give you just a bit of background, in the 18th century, the Kingdom of Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany, was among the first countries of the world to introduce free and compulsory education. After the Prussians were defeated by Napoleon in 1806, it was decided that the reason why the battle was lost was that the Prussian soldiers were thinking for themselves in the battlefield instead of following orders. To make sure that this couldn't happen again, a new eight-year system of schooling was created. This new system provided not only the skills needed for the early industrialized world, such as reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also a strict education that taught duty, discipline, respect for authority, and the ability to follow orders. Pause. So as you all just heard here, after Napoleon defeated the Germans, the Germans realized that a lot of their soldiers in the war were thinking for themselves. And as a result, they contributed their loss in the battle to the soldiers thinking independently. So the federal government created school in an attempt to relinquish all individual thought pattern and belief. Again, if that went over your head, let me reiterate. Once Napoleon defeated the Germans, the Germans believed that the reason why they lost was because their soldiers were thinking independently. So school was created to stop critical thinking and independent thought. That way they could follow orders, not question authority, and ultimately become better soldiers and workers for the government. The government wants you to go to school so you can learn not to be an independent thinker. That way you won't question authority. That way you'll get a nine to five and you'll go to work and make these companies rich and make the United States richer until you inevitably die. Then your child, if you choose to have one, will replace you and the cycle will continue forever and ever and ever. Elite children destined for higher offices went on to attend private schools while the rest of the population had no access to the secondary education. They were destined for the working class. Through this new system, the Prussian court tried to create social obedience in the citizens through indoctrination. Every individual had to become convinced at the core of their being that the king was just, his decisions were always right, and the need for obedience paramount. In truth, the entire purpose of the system was to instill loyalty to the crown and to train young men for the military and bureaucracy. To do this, 
it was necessary to squeeze out all independent thinking from the masses. Influencing this new system from the beginning was Prussian philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Combining John Locke's view that the children are a blank slate and Rousseau's ideas on how to write on that slate, Prussia established an educational system that was considered scientific in nature. An important part of the Prussian system was that it defined for the child what was to be learned, what was to be thought about, and how long to think about it. In order to have an efficient policy-making class and a subclass beneath it, it was believed that one had to remove the power of most people to make sense out of the available information. In other words, critical thinking had to be done away with. Now, if you're wondering why the average person doesn't know that the North American education system is based directly on the Prussian model, it might just be because its original purpose was not designed for the good of the individual, but for the good of the government. Told you. I told you. I told you. Come on, man. Come on, man. And Sid is here wondering why they're not teaching black excellence in the curriculum. They don't want nobody knowing about that. They don't want any black people out here knowing that they were kings and queens. Because if they did, this would directly violate what they already put into place and it might stop black people from going to work and it might allow black people to become independent thinkers and that would go directly against what the United States wants so they are not going to teach this aka black excellence aka black people being kings and queens because it would go against the European status quo. This not only goes for black people, it goes for everybody. The philosophy of Johann Fitch directly influenced the creation of the Prussian model of schooling. As he is quoted saying, The schools must fashion the person, and fashion him in such a way that he simply cannot will otherwise than what you wish him to will. With quotes like these, you can see why his involvement is not well known. Education should aim at destroying free will, so that after pupils are thus schooled, they will be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. When this technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for more than one generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. In 1807, in a Berlin occupied by Napoleon, Johann Fitch gave a series of famous addresses to the German nation. Fitch spoke of the superiority of German people above all others. The content of these speeches was a catalyst for the Prussian education system and German nationalism. In other earlier works, he calls Jews a state within a state that would, quote, undermine the German nation. He openly expressed a desire to expel Jews from Germany. Fitch had a deep influence on the rise of the Third Reich and continues to be deemed, quote, the spiritual father of modern neo-Nazism. Which begs the question, why would the father of American education make it a law that every child spend their youth in a system created by the father of neo-Nazism? Pause, did y'all just hear that? We are following the teachings of the father of neo-Nazism. Why is the American school systems following the teachings of the father of neo-Nazism? Why would the father of American education make it a law that every child spend their youth in a system created by the father of neo-Nazism? Historians reflect that one of the greatest social factors that allowed a man like Hitler to rise to power was that the German people had been bred from birth to respect authority above all else and accept it without question. Which begs another question. If the entire population of North America is raised in a system adopted from pre-Nazi Germany, what are we setting ourselves up for? And if this irrefutable evidence was not enough proof for you, like the wise man Sid always says, don't worry, I got you. Let's play civil rights legend, Jane Elliott's interview with Sid three years ago. And I know that it is expected of us because when I did the blue eyed brown eyed exercise in my classroom in Riceville, Iowa, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I immediately found out how it feels to teach outside the norm and to teach in opposition to racism. That is not something you are allowed to do in this country. You are forced if you want to keep your job. You don't say, Mrs. Elliott. So you're not allowed to teach outside the norm or to teach against racism in the curriculum, huh? You are forced if you want to keep your job to perpetuate the status quo. And the status quo is if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, hang around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. And if you're black, get back. All right. And that's what we teach in the schools in this country on a daily basis. In this country, what we have is not education, it's indoctrination. And we start, we used to start at the age of five. Now we start at the age of three. 
Told you. I told you. I told you. Because one of our former presidents said, give me a child from the age of three to five and he'll be mine for a lifetime. And at that point, we started early childhood then. Join us on the next part of A Pretty Lie Instead of an Ugly Truth, Episode Zero, The Truth About Africa and Egypt.